During this lecture, we will look at a very interesting prophetic period of more than a thousand years. You will also hear about the greatest crime in human history. Buckle up and may God bless you in a very unique manner. In our lecture on the image of Daniel 2, we heard the good news that we have come to the end of a long night of struggle. A righteous kingdom will soon replace the cruel nations and Christ will be the king. In Daniel chapter 7, the nations of antiquity reappear in the form of vicious beasts, a lion, a bear and a leopard. The prophet spends quite a considerable time when he describes the characteristics of the fourth beast. He endeavors to get our attention focused on a little horn. In our previous lecture, we looked at five characteristics of this little horn. Number one, he arose from the ten horns. In other words, we can expect him to appear somewhere in Europe. Second point, he only made his appearance after the others were established. This is a very important time aspect. Only after the establishment of the nations of Western Europe would he make his appearance. Point number three, he uprooted three of the other horns or kingdoms. There is only one power that did this, and that was the power of the medieval church. Point number four, the prophet Daniel predicted that this little horn would be different, and he was. All the other European nations were political entities. The medieval church was both religious and political. Point number five, a remarkable prediction is the fact that this little horn would be prominent. History attests to this fact. The church dominated Europe for many, many centuries. And now for the identifying marks, number 6 through 10. Mark number 7 is found in Daniel 7.25 where it says, He will speak against the Most High. While you're looking at St. Peter's Square, we must ask ourselves, what is the meaning of speaking against the Most High? Revelation chapter 13 verses 5 and 6 gives us the answer. The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies. Proud words and blasphemy are synonymous. We call it Hebrew parallelism. This is a serious accusation. Verse 6, he opened his mouth to blaspheme God. The beast of Revelation 13 possesses the same characteristics as the little horn of Daniel chapter 7. John gives us additional information that pertains to our day. If you look carefully, you will see the Pope looking through the window with a red banner. Before we look at the blasphemous papal utterances, we must get the biblical definition of blasphemy. John chapter 10 verses 30 to 33. I and the Father are one. Again the Jews picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus said to them, I have shown you many great miracles from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any of these, replied the Jews, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Now that is very clear. When mortal man says he is like God who is the creator, he blasphemes. May God help us to be humble. When you study Egyptology, you discover that the Egyptians also worshipped their pharaohs. Centuries later, the same phenomenon occurred as ruler worship in Rome. But I was shocked when I discovered that the Popes made similar claims. The following statements are not to slander, but to look at the accuracy of Bible prophecy. In 1439, the Council of Florence decreed, We define that the Roman Pontiff is successor of Blessed Peter, Prince of the Apostles, and the true Vicar of Christ. This comes from the Most Holy Councils, page 526. Nowhere in the world will you find an exhibition of art that compares to those in St. Peter's and the Vatican. And nowhere in the world do you find such blasphemous statements as here. 
Listen to this shocking statement. We hold on this earth the place of God Almighty. This comes from the great encyclical letters of Pope Leo XIII. While looking at this poor leopard child from Malawi, we are reminded in Romans 3.21 that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Whether Pope or pauper, only Jesus can cleanse us. This is St. John Lateran in Rome, the seat of the papacy where the Pope lies in state when he dies. Listen to the next statement. This is surely a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Given in Rome from our palace the 10th of February 1817, the 14th jurisdiction of the Most Holy Pontiff and the Father in Christ, and the Lord our God, the Pope Leo the Twelfth. I'm standing in one of the confession cubicles in St. Peter's. Did you know that blasphemy has yet another definition? Luke 5, verses 20 and 21. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, Who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Daniel 7.25 predicted that the little horn would speak great words against the Most High. In other words, he would blaspheme. Does the papacy admit that it has the power to forgive sins? The judicial authority will even include the power to pardon sin. This comes from the Catholic Encyclopedia, Volume 12, Article, under Pope, page 265. The priest who waits for people to confess their sins is actually fulfilling Bible prophecy. Acts 4 verse 12 says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. My heart bleeds for every sincere Catholic. A church or a pope does not save us. We are only saved by the merits of Jesus Christ who died for us. Daniel 7.25 predicted that the seventh point of identification would be that of persecution. He will persecute the saints of the Most High. Noted Catholic Thomas Aquinas said that convicted heretics should be put to death just as surely as other criminals because they were counterfeiters. Catholic professor Alfred Baudrillard says, The Catholic Church is a respecter of conscience and liberty. Nevertheless, when confronted by heresy, she has recourse to force, to corporal punishment, to torture. She lit in Italy the funeral piles of the Inquisition. This comes from the Catholic Church Renaissance and Protestantism, pages 182 and 183. This is another sad fulfillment of Bible prophecy. The eighth identification mark concerns the changing of God's eternal holy law. Now this is very shocking. Daniel 7.25 says, He shall think to change times and law. I don't like to share this information, but I will be guilty if I don't. This is the main entrance to the Catholic Church in the famous town of Lourdes in France, where daily miracles are reported. I watched the crowds of sincere people coming to find physical and spiritual healing. Many thoughts rushed through my mind as I saw them walking to the so-called holy cave for healing. I thought of the terrible ignorance in the Christian church today. Do these worshippers realize that their church changed God's holy law? I had to take a picture of these two little innocent children at Lourdes. As long as they keep growing and learning, their parents will be happy. Our Heavenly Father also expects us, as His children, to keep on growing in the knowledge of His Word. If you take a careful look at the commandments in the Bible compared to the Catholic Catechism, you will notice that the second commandment is deleted and the tenth is divided into two. The Catechism reads, Question, what is the second command? Answer, the second commandment of God is 
Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Is this really what the second commandment says? No. It is always safe to check what the Bible says. Let me read it to you and you'll notice the difference. Exodus 20 verses 4 and 5. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything. You shall not bow down and worship them. I took this picture in Rome in a church called Maria Araculi where a wooden image is on display. And here I saw with my own eyes how a room full of pilgrims bowed down and venerated or worshipped a little statue called Bambinu. Millions of people from all over the world come to St. Peter's to kiss the toe of Peter, so they think. Why did the little horn scrap the second command, which forbids this kind of worship? Because image worship was a common practice in the ancient world. I took this picture at Pompeii, not far from Rome. This is a typical example of people having their idols in their courtyards. You're looking at a newly excavated home in Herculaneum, next to Pompeii. What do you see? You see an image of an idol. Voices spoke through these statues, similar to a modern seance. The worship of these images degraded people. This is Constantine's arch. In order to persuade pagans to join the Christian church, he tolerated the worship of images. So instead of worshipping the statue of Aphrodite, they changed the name to that of Mary. In a little museum at an Egyptian town called Malawi, I discovered these interesting graven images. People worshipped them in ancient times. Here you have a mother and a child wrapped in linen. The mother's name is Isis and the child is called Horus. When the church and paganism compromised, they only changed the names of the mother and the child to Mary and Jesus. The veneration of the graven images continued. When I visited St. Peter's in Rome, I was told that this statue represented Peter. But is this really Peter? No. I subsequently learned that long before this statue was venerated as St. Peter, the heathen world actually kissed away the toe of Jupiter. The disc you see on top is connected to sun worship. Whenever I watch these sincere worshippers, my heart cries. Salvation cannot be found in pilgrimages to venerate images. Jesus is the only one who can handle my sin problem. 1 John chapter 2 verse 1 My dear children, I write this to you, that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Not the Pope, not the saints, not even Mary. Our friend and advocate is Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. There is another good reason why the second commandment was deleted. It takes the focus away from Jesus, our mediator, and puts it on the church. Daniel 7 predicted that the little horn would tamper with God's holy law, and this is exactly what happened. This is another quote from a Catholic source, The Pope can modify divine law. Catholics say the Pope has power to change times, to abrogate laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. Please pause a moment and ask yourself this question. Can a man change the words and teachings of Jesus? Can a sinful man change the precepts and laws given by a holy God? When we read from the Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine, we see how they altered the fourth commandment. Question, what are we commanded by the third commandment? Answer, by the third commandment, we are commanded to worship God in a special manner on Sunday, the Lord's Day. In Matthew 5.17, Jesus says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law and the prophets, I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Maybe you've read about Laodicea in the book of Revelation. The Lord says he has a problem with this church because it is lukewarm. 
When this stream of thermal water leaves its source, it is still hot. But as it flows down the hills, it cools down and forms beautiful crystals. When I visited these beautiful white sediments, my thoughts went back to AD 336, when the early church committed a very serious crime right here at Laodicea. The builders of these water pipes used heavy insulation to maintain the temperature of the water, but when it reached Laodicea, it was lukewarm so typical of the spiritual condition of the people when John wrote his letter to them. Three centuries later, the early church changed the fourth commandment right here at Laodicea. This was the first in a series of four decrees to abolish God's holy Sabbath. I'm quoting from the Convert's Catechism of Holy Catholic Doctrine, page 50 by Rev. Peter Guyman. Question. Which is the Sabbath day? Answer. Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer. We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Daniel told us through prophetic utterance he will speak against the Most High and oppress his saints and try to change the set times and the laws. The saints will be handed over to him for a time, times and half a time. Daniel 7 verse 25 Catholics say the Pope has power to change times, to abrogate laws and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. Before I left Laodicea, I had a little talk with the Lord. I asked Him to help me never to change any of His commandments. I also asked Him for divine power to make me an obedient child. Now we look at our next identifying mark of the little horn power. It is coupled to prophetic time. Let's read it. Daniel 7.25 The saints will be handed over to Him for a time, times and half a time. The word that is being used here for time is the Aramaic word idon, which means a prophetic year consisting of 360 days. This is our ninth identifying mark. There are some who think that because they are Christians, nothing bad should happen to them. But Jesus, our example, suffered and in love he forewarned his followers that they would pass through persecution for 1,260 prophetic days. Let's do a quick review. Wind in this prophetic context stood for what? For war. Water stands for multitudes. And beasts? Kingdoms. Now what about horns? They also represent kingdoms. What about time? Times and half a time. Should we take it as little or symbolic time? In the Bible we find what is called the year-day principle. This means that whenever time appears in a prophetic context, one prophetic day equals one literal year. Two examples will suffice. Numbers 14 verse 34 and Ezekiel 4 verse 6. Each day for a year. Let's do some arithmetic. Time singular equals one year. In the Jewish calendar, a year had 360 days, so time equals 360 days. Times is plural, or two years. We multiply 360 days by two and you get 720 days. Half a time, or half a year, is 180 days. If you add up all these days, you get... 1,260 days. Does this make sense? Now this comes from Daniel's prophecy. So these are prophetic days. Therefore they become 1,260 literal years. Before consulting the historians about the accuracy of the 1,260 day or year prophecy, let us first Look at the woman who fled into the wilderness in Revelation chapter 12. 
In verse 6, John calls the period of persecution 1,260 days. And then in verse 14, he speaks about time, times, and half a time. By means of this Hebrew parallelism, the Bible interprets itself. This prophetic time frame is so important that God tells us about it seven times. We just looked at the first one in Daniel 7.25. Let's look at the six others when they are described in Daniel and Revelation. Daniel 12.7 speaks of times, time and half a time. Revelation chapter 11 verse 2 speaks of 42 months. Revelation 12.6 mentions 1,260 days. Revelation 12.14 says time, times and half a time. And then Revelation 13.5 speaks of 42 months. Each time this 1,260 days is applied consistently to the papal persecution. You see, my dear friend, because God loves every single human being, he doesn't want us to miss out. In order to discover the official beginning of the 1,260 years of papal domination, we will have to consult the historians. Let's begin our research in Istanbul in Turkey. Formerly the city was called Constantinople. Constantinople was named after Emperor Constantine who used to reign here. He was the builder of the beautiful Hagia Sophia, which means holy wisdom. And it was in the year 538 AD that he issued a decree in which he gave the Pope power to discipline heretics. It was also in this year, 538, that the last of the three kingdoms that opposed the church, the Catholic Church, the Ostrogoths, were uprooted. This huge column near the Sultanahmet in Istanbul is of great historical importance. It commemorates Emperor Constantine's decree to appoint the Bishop of Rome as the official head of the church in 538 AD. Let's do a thorough investigation of this amazing 1260 day or year prophecy. By 476 AD the ten kingdoms were established and 62 years later in 538 the Bishop of Rome received official recognition. Let's add 1260 years to 538 and we come to 1798. According to the prophecy of Daniel 7.25, the Pope's power had to come to an end. Any good encyclopedia tells you that the Pope was captured in 1798. What an accurate fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Both here entered Rome on the 10th of February 1798 and proclaimed a republic. Half of Europe thought Napoleon's veto would be obeyed and that with the Pope, the papacy was dead. This comes from modern papacy by Reverend Rickerby. Bible prophecy is amazing. When the great prophetic clock struck at the end of the 1260 year prophecy, the power of the papacy received a deadly wound. I took this picture at Santa Scala in Rome. What a pathetic sight. Many people despise these outcasts and pass by, but they are precious in God's sight. This Italian prostitute can no longer sell her body for Italian lira. She has to beg in order to prolong her miserable life. Although discarded by society, she is still loved by God. God loves every Pope who ever lived and He loves every Catholic in the world. He loves the people but not the system. He pled with this church for many centuries to repent of their false doctrines. History tells the sad story how this mighty church kept on rejecting the light that came to her ever since her inception. What is God going to do to her? Daniel 7.26 But the court will sit and his power will be taken away and be completely destroyed forever. 
What a tragic end to a system that relies partly on Christ and partly on good works in order to be saved. Sinners can only hope for eternal life when they lay their pride in the dust of humility and rely entirely on the merits of Jesus Christ to be saved. You don't have to approach God through human instrumentalities in order to be forgiven of your sins. You can approach God the Father through the merits of Jesus Christ directly and he will forgive you. In this awesome vision, Daniel saw the courtroom of heaven. Whom did he see sitting in judgment? Daniel 7 verses 9 and 10 As I looked, thrones were set in place and the Ancient of Days took his seat. The court was seated and the books were opened. Before Jesus comes a second time, he wants to remove even the record of his people's confessed sins. He is just about ready to give us his reward of eternal life. Matthew 16:27 For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. Have you confessed your unkindness? Have you confessed your greatest sin, your inhumanity to people? Have you asked God to help you to be a little kinder, a little gentler? If you have, be assured that he is going to reward your reliance upon him. At the Holocaust Museum of Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, I looked at the sorrowful results of a people who ignored the prophecies of Daniel. I was impressed by a message I read there. It says forgetfulness leads to exile, while remembrance is the secret of redemption. Let us not forget the kind warnings of the prophecies because it would lead us into exile. Let us remember the kind warnings of the prophecies because it is the secret of redemption. Daniel pictures the glorious end of God's kind and obedient children. He tells us in Daniel chapter 7 verse 18. But the saints of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever, yes, forever and ever. You know, I like this forever and ever. Forever happy. Forever in the company of kind people. Forever in the presence of the lovely Jesus. I want to be there. What about you? Once we have learned what truth is, we have a responsibility. May God help you to accept what you have heard and share it with others. But please do it in love. Let us pray. Lord, we stand amazed at the facts brought to us through history. We realize how shrewd and subtle our enemy is and that he wishes to guide us on the wrong track. Please help us not to go astray, but to follow the narrow road to your kingdom as you are the way, the truth and the life. May we distinctly hear your voice as you say, This is the way. Follow me. In Jesus' name. Amen.